Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore the allure and growing influence of conspiracy theories and how they're both combated by and influenced by media literacy. My guest is Renee Hobbs, professor of communication studies at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island and director of the Media Education Lab. The Media Education Lab holds a monthly webinar called the Digi URI Media Club. And earlier this month, participants explored how conspiracy theories are affected by media literacy and how educators can navigate these lessons with students. I attended that webinar and have been given permission to share some of it with you. Dr. Jason Schranz from Gogubit Community College said it's important to consider how people come to embrace conspiracy theories. What makes people more vulnerable, more susceptible to conspiracy theory? A lot of times it doesn't have to do just with education. You know, we have this image of the person who's, you know, vulnerable to conspiracy theories. She, she has like the person with a tinfoil hat and all that. But yet again, when we look at the topic, whether it's um, vaccines or um, of political conspiracy theories, you know, anybody is, is really vulnerable to these. And so what is it? It is a sense of wanting to belong to a community. I think it's a, an identity thing, um, wanting to uh, be the person who knows better, maybe, or, or who has the information before you do. Michelle Ciccone of Foxborough High School pointed out that conspiracy theories may start simple. But they really quickly get super complicated and convoluted, like QAnon, like anything can fit into the QAnon universe because it's constantly stretched to fit whatever happens in the news. So there's like this weird interplay between a simple maybe like origin story or something and then the like maintenance of the, the narrative. Some of these conspiracy theories, people are obsessed with the technical scientific details and like go real deep on that. So I don't know if the simplicity is like a, it's like a way in. You know, I wonder if it's simplicity or if it's uh, a sense of order, which I think are, are two things which, which run parallel to each other for a while. Um, but I, I think as you mentioned, Michelle, like that order can continue to get convoluted, especially when the simple order doesn't fit all the details. It has to get more and more um, you know, variously structured, I guess. And the reason we're now talking about conspiracy theories is that they are becoming more part of the media landscape, says Schrantz. You know, I've had similar experiences in class where, uh, you know, I might bring up a conspiracy theory as part of an example, and I can tell by the silence or just the, the kind of looking around the classroom that, you know, where, where maybe 15 years ago to bring this up, student, you know, there's a sense of, oh yeah, you know, I mean, there are people out there who believe that, not us, not in this institution, but then you bring it up, you know, in, in more modern day, and there's always a chance that there might be some people in that group that believe in it. We often assume that conspiracy theories are fringe, but Ralph Beliveau of the University of Oklahoma reminds us that a pivotal part of U.S. history is actually based on a conspiracy theory. There's a great series about reconstruction. It's like a four-part thing that Henry Louis Gates did. And it's interesting because as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about reconstruction and the conspiracy theories that are kind of built into that, like attitudes about race and how you can, in you know, how you see this sort of like attempt after the Civil War to try to balance things and make them more just and how they're completely undermined by what's still the conspiracy theory about black people that exists in the heads of most of the people in the South. And that ends up becoming the lost cause, which is, you know, probably one of the great American conspiracy theories, right? the idea that the Civil War was about all these other things and not about slavery. So I think there's a really interesting connection between historical explanation and, and conspiracy theory thinking, too. In this episode, part one of a two-part interview, Renee and I explore why people are drawn to conspiracy theories, their role in our socio-political context, and the issues and challenges in our current marketplace of ideas, in the classroom, on social media, and in our public discourse. conversation about conspiracy theories in media literacy. Why do you think people are drawn to conspiracy theories? What is it about them that is so intoxicating for us? Conspiracy theories are intoxicating because uh, mystery is one of the five powerful forces of sensationalism, along with sex, violence, children, animals, right? The unknown. <laughs> These are lures that uh, 
attract and hold attention because they're they've actually been biologically functional for almost all of human history. Wow. Right? Yes. <laughs> Paying attention. Sex, violence, children, animals, and the unknown has been good for our survival. Yes. Wow. I didn't think about that. That's amazing. And animals, like I love that because clearly and I hate it too. I'll stop and watch a dog and then I get like 10 dog videos. I'm like, no, no, no. I didn't want 10 dog videos. I just wanted to watch the one. Um, but it is a draw. It does compel us. And and that aspect, mystery. A conspiracy theory um, taps into all the little, like Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and uh, Encyclopedia Brown when I was a kid and all those, you know, wanting to solve stuff um, in in almost a simple, it's a simple way in. So there's, it's mystery, but it's accessible to everyone. Yeah. And, and, and all conspiracy theories have a really interesting ingredient, which is there's always an unknown malevolent force. So a good guy, that's us. And, and we are being victimized by a bad guy. That's the unknown malevolent force. One of the things that I find really fascinating and when I teach about conspiracy theories uh, to my students, we always talk about how conspiracy theories are not a falsifiable. You know, using the scientific method, we can prove something true or false. We use evidence. We collect evidence in a systematic way. But uh, conspiracy theories, when, when evidence is presented that contradicts a conspiracy theory, that just proves that just deepens the idea of the malevolent force right, right. <laughs> it becomes a part of the larger conspiracy see see the the man the mystery person is trying to hold us down or trying to lie to us and mislead us yes exactly and that's fascinating too because that means that they can last forever and they do conspiracy theories are entertaining they're very entertaining and that's partly why i'm not as afraid of q as some of my media uh, critic friends. And I'm not afraid of uh, the fact that we take pleasure in constructing these crazy, ridiculous uh, 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 fantasies. Uh, history shows us, however, that crazy, ridiculous fantasies can be used for despicable, dangerous, and inhumane ends. Yes, right. And so talking about QAnon um, and some conspiracy theories, there's a recent story uh, out of Oregon. Apparently, there are conspiracy theories going around that Antifa was going around starting the fires. And this led some uh, conservative activists armed to blockade roads and demand that people they thought of as different give their identification. And, and that can turn into a very volatile and violent situation. And so in the midst of fighting fires and dealing with emergencies and evacuating people, authorities have had to spend time trying to debunk this theory. And so and so it's, hor it's heartbreaking and potentially very scary that someone could get hurt just by trying to be on a road and looking different. And then also... <laughs> And then also that we need to focus on fighting these fires and keeping people safe. And here we are doing this. So when you talk about, and I do want to get to the point of the entertainment in a moment, but let's start here because as, as you said, throughout history, and I think we're seeing some examples of that now, it can be dangerous and, and problematic. Yeah. So certainly uh, conspiracy theories can turn into harmful disinformation right, and can be used as a form of propaganda. So when I teach about conspiracy theories, I do it in the context of trying to better understand propaganda. And propaganda can be intentional and strategic as a way to control the masses. The idea is conspiracy theories uh, can be used by elites and people in power for their own political agenda, right? And I feel like for young people, disentangling the conspiracy theory from its context where it's used by people in power as a uh, part of a, a political strategy is a really important distinction to make, right? Because was JFK assassinated was, you know, a great little mystery, but it, ha it existed within a political context. And that's in fact a great opportunity. One of the reasons why conspiracy theories are so great to teach about is that because students are, so, it's like catnip, Students are so interested in the topic that they were willing to go into the rabbit hole and find the research. And you can actually get kids to understand some much bigger theoretical issues about how meaning is shared and how social power is used, right? Through symbols and media uh, by letting the kid drive the train uh, in unpacking a conspiracy theory and getting really deep down into it. So how do you guide a student in that sense? So you you walk in and introduce, and I imagine, 
uh, all of us ha are uh, intoxicated by or compelled by one conspiracy theory or another. I'll admit, while I don't believe it, I am completely fascinated by the Kennedy assassination. It's, and I'm even thrilled that it's in the Umbrella Academy, which is a comic book that's now a series. And it's represent so it's still alive and well as far as I'm completely fascinated by the 9-11 towers falling straight down, even though I'm not necessarily a believer in the theory. I'm compelled by it. So how, you know, if a student walks in and they've got this idea and they're fascinated by it and they're pretty sure they're right, how do you help them start to unpack this? So uh, the tried and true classic media literacy exercise uh, is called uh, From Credible to Incredible, right? So the assignment is go out and find 10 sources, right, on this topic, whatever your topic is and then rank order them from most credible to least credible. <gasps> I love this. And be prepared to explain why this one you found the most credible and why this one you found the least credible. As a kid does this over a period of, well, however long the assignment is, two weeks, a week, even a few days, right? The kid begins to get more metacognitive and start to notice, oh, I think, if there's a spelling error, it's automatically not credible. Or <laughs> I think if there's a photo and a nice design, it's automatically credible. Right? Right. They start to become aware of their own biases in how they're judging and interpreting. And of course, then they're also learning to do, right, comparing and contrasting. They're also doing lateral reading, right? They're starting to see how some of the same ideas recur through all of these sources. Um, that's a great way to start the process of unpacking conspiracy theories as a really fun research project. Oh, I love that. And I think lateral reading of the, and I want to talk about the the role of and limitations of media literacy in a moment, but, the, but lateral reading to me is one of the most powerful tools we have for checking sources, checking credibility, and also now you obviously exploring conspiracy theories and their credibility. Can we point out some of the limitations of lateral reading, though? I would love to. Let me define it real quick. So lateral reading is basically jumping off the page you're on, going to other web pages, doing some searches, and reading across different sources rather than staying in a source. So forgive me. Now, please, uh, what are the limitations? So lateral reading is a tool developed by journalists and fact checkers, right? And uh, it actually relies on having access to an explosive variety of content, right? Literally being able to uh, have a Wikipedia and have a, a, a variety of choices there so that you can jump around and see different points of view on the same topic. But that doesn't work for everything. And in fact, that doesn't work for a lot of things that are super really important. <laughs> Right. And it also tends to uh, confirm what we would call established or establishment points of view, because, in fact, the most visible content online is going to be produced by the major media companies and it's going to look really good. And uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times are all going to say the same thing, but that might not be the whole story. <laughs> Right. Yes. So I think that lateral reading has its own limitations because of the bias that assumes that if everybody's saying it, it must be true. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Dr. Renee Hobbs about conspiracy theories and media literacy. You know, I always think in science terms of uh, when the first uh, researchers said, oh, we think it was a meteor that killed the dinosaurs. And everyone's like, what? Get out of town. You're ridiculous. Go away. And of course, now it's like widely accepted. That's a great example, Gina, and a great example. And the one I tend to use with my, when I talk about that idea that conspiracy theories are sometimes true, right? And that is why you have to keep an open mind about all knowledge and, you know, kind of open-mindedness is a key feature of being media literate. And the uh, conspiracy theory that I like to talk to my students about is the mutter brigade going on down in, um, in the South when um, African-American families were noticing to each other that their family members were like going to the hospital and they were getting some kind of treatment, but they weren't getting better. They weren't getting better. They weren't getting better. They weren't getting better. It seemed like when they went to the hospital, like they were getting sicker 
right? And then the Tuskegee syphilis study was revealed by a tenacious journalist. This guy just, he worked for 10 years to uncover that evil secret that men were being untreated because they were there, the, the degenerative qualities of their disease was being used as an experiment. So yeah, it was a conspiracy theory, but it turned out to be true. And that just puts a pit in my stomach as far as thinking about the, 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 what people are capable of, but that feeds into the uh, people who follow conspiracy theories that just feeds into it more. Right. So we've got, we've got, well, it's been true before. It could be true again. And we've got, you know, a lot of times people aren't believed right away. Stick with me. I promise you this will bear out to be true. So you've got all these things going on that can help conspiracy theorists or people who buy into a conspiracy theory or two can help them stick with their guns as far as believing in this. So I don't know. What do you suggest? How do you solve this world problem? <laughs> well, as you might remember, our friend Dana Boyd blamed media literacy for the epistemological crisis of, of the era. Uh, the reason why we don't trust the media and the reason why uh, the journalism's in the toilet e economically and financially and the reason why everybody is asking critical questions in this nightmare of polarization that we have right now, it's all because of media literacy, right? Which privileged the practice of asking critical questions. And uh, of course, when she developed this argument, it seemed to me kind of crazy, but kind of true. Actually, I, I, I think it's an honor that she pinned it on media literacy. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would have suggested the enlightenment. There you go. <laughs> it's the enlightenment's fault, please. <laughs> yeah, I think it really happened in the 18th century. And I think there was this gigantic idea that doubt was part of faith. Remember Spinoza, right? The idea that, you know, you could ask questions and doubt authority, but still be loyal to authority. You could ask questions about God, but still believe in God. Like this was the revolution of which media literacy is just a pedagogical embroidery. Right? Yeah. So then where does it, where's that point where it goes over, goes off the rails? Like, so it, obviously, obviously, we, we love the Enlightenment. We think, you know, questioning things is important. Thinking critically is important. Uh, being able to grapple and wrestle with ideas without giving up everything is important. Being able to talk with someone with whom you disagree. All of that's super important. And yet, take that and tinker. And, and there's something that all of a sudden makes it become, you know, the, the, the flip side of a good coin is the bad side of the coin, right? So, so what is it? What's going on there? Yeah, I think uh, there are, uh, there's a lot of evidence in the culture right now that the marketplace of ideas is broken, right? The Enlightenment's major contribution to what we, what we think about as um, modern society is this idea that there is a range of information and some of it is good, some of it is bad. There are opinions that are valuable. There are opinions that are crap and that humans make choices in this marketplace of ideas. In general, the whole concept of democracy is rooted in that idea. So, so right. we don't want to let go of that idea too lightly because it is so profoundly linked to democracy. But it's certainly the case. And we see this every which way to Sunday, right? That we are not always rational consumers in the marketplace of ideas. We vote with our, our gut, with our groin, with our hearts, and not with our head, like more oftentimes than not, right? In fact, it seems like the more choices we have, the poorer quality choices we make. So some people think that since the marketplace of ideas is broken, then we need to regulate the marketplace more to correct its defects. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing an, an interest in trying to regulate the marketplace of ideas to correct its defects. And maybe that means regulating uh, social media. Maybe that means breaking up big tech. Maybe that means uh, quality control on information, uh, labeling stuff that's junk as junk. Those are all ways to correct the defects of the marketplace of ideas. But, you know, I, I... I think that's an important debate. And I myself uh, appreciate that point of view, but you know, these days I'm reading George Orwell 
I guess you probably know why, right? Yeah, no. Oh. I, really? George Orwell? <laughs> That's an odd choice for tonight's. <laughs> so as the election season emerges, uh, I find it uh, worth reflecting on the power of government and the power of ministries of propaganda to redefine lies as truth, to redefine beauty as ugliness, to foreshorten and limit our understanding of the world by the way we use language and imagery, right? And I feel like um, those dangers, so yes, the marketplace of ideas is broken and yes, there's a threat of authoritarian uh, regimes that reshape the nature of reality and truth by their manipulation of information. So mm, I kind of feel like that's a rock in a hard place. And that's what, it, that's why we're, that's why we're confused right now. Neither of those options seems great. I totally agree. I think we're, um, we, I think Americans in particular, although I, I'm sure I'm certain it's global, but Americans in particular, we've walked through life with this idea that one, we're exceptional and two, that our democracy is stable and three, that it can't happen here. I mean, we've, we've walked through life, at least someone my age and, and older that with those ideas. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, 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 is what happening? Is this really happening? This feels like this. And I think in that, in that, in that space where someone is trying to tell us that two plus two equals five and there are four lights, shoot, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up the Star Trek reference, but there are this many lights. When you can't even trust the per the president who we've held up, the sands are shifting. And I think in that context, a conspiracy theory feels like a rock. It feels like an island. It feels like something I can hold on to. And I would add that the way we educate about media literacy and the way, I mean, I think there's a lot of good stuff there, but I think it's not consistent. And I, I, I wonder if we, if our children are spending time in K-12, you know, maybe not necessarily learning some of the skills that we need to learn about how to navigate life and, and how to think about, um, you know, you mentioned speech, First Amendment. We're grappling now with what exactly does that mean? Does freedom of speech mean freedom of uh, of reach someone just use that term do I automatically get a platform because I have something to say and if someone disagrees with me they're canceling me I mean I think a lot of these I'm sorry I'm going all over the place but I think a lot of this stuff kind of all feeds into the shifting sands that make conspiracy theories super attractive yeah I completely agree with you I think the cancel culture is um, a beautiful example of what George Orwell told us about how language uh, reshapes reality, right? And how the words we use embody propaganda in them. You know, in 1979, Neil Postman wrote this really interesting article uh, on propaganda. He was actually doing media literacy, although in 1979, that word had not yet been invented, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he, he was analyzing propaganda and he observed that every time we open up our mouths, we have the capacity to engage in something like propaganda because the very choice of the words we use carries an ideology, carries a set of values and carries a, and pushes that worldview onto somebody else, right? And so in some ways, when you're growing up in a, a world where polarization has become normative, right? And this side uses one set of words and means things by them, and this side uses another set of words and means by them, then it's really confusing. And I do think that teachers struggle to teach media literacy under the increasingly polarized world that we had. You know, in 2016, at the last presidential election, teachers were afraid to teach media literacy during the election. Most of most strenuously avoided it. Why? Well, because you couldn't help if you were teaching about the election in 2016, you had to address things like grab them by the put, right? And all kinds of other crap. So it was just too awful. And the day after the election was the single highest recording of um anti-Semitic and defamatory language reported in American schools. Over 2,000 examples were reported oh, to God. the Anti-Defamation League with kids marching down the hallways going, lock him up, lock her up, lock her up, and go back to Mexico. Because children were empowered by the Trump election. 
right? And that rebellious, I mean, let's be honest, we all lived through that phase. Gina, I bet you were rebellious as hell when you were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And it could feel exciting to go against what your parents' values were, Mm -hmm. right? And to embrace this uh, radical new way of thinking, that can feel exciting. So teachers just struggle because that's hard to confront. That's a developmental characteristic of adolescence that means that growing up at this unique moment in time carries with it a certain baggage or a certain burden, Yeah. right, that we have to be really sensitive to. And that's why I, tr- I try to be aware that um, educators and parents are, are struggling because uh, this is a different era. And the old tricks that we used to be able to use, the old tools in our toolkit, they don't necessarily work the same way anymore. Yeah, you're right. And when you were talking, what came to my mind is, you know, when I was being taught in junior high and high school, you could point to Nazi Germany and be like, that's, you know, black and white. He was evil. These people were harmed. We were the good guys. You know, it's it's an easy story to tell, even though, you know, if you look into the history of World War II, it's slightly more complex, but the evil nature of concentration camps is clear. And, and now we've got, you know, we've got people being jailed at the border. We've got, when, when we discuss those issues, it means we're taking a side in our own country, you know, to some educators. The idea is, you know, if I want to denounce propaganda, or I mean, propaganda is always there, but if I want to denounce the, the really malicious propaganda, the lock her up, send her back to Mexico, put them behind bars, grab them by the pussy, I have to take a side. Um, and that can be dangerous and you can get pushback. And I hope we would all have the courage to do it, but, but it's a scary place to put yourself in, especially when it means your job might be on the line or, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Teachers are government workers, yeah. right? They're agents of the state. Yeah. They are government workers. They are agents of the state. And that is, that's always been uh, true. And it's a very vulnerable place for teachers to be. I think there's another thing going on though. And when we talk about, um, how um, immigrants and refugees are depicted in media, uh, in, in news as propaganda, there is this huge sort of uh, denial uh, that we all have going on in the culture about our own desensitization. You know, when we saw the children in cages, in Mexico, it kind of jolted us, momentarily jolted us. And then now, oh, the Greek refugees, 30,000 are homeless. The Rohingya Muslims are completely non-people, right? Displaced and completely without any political or social or civil or human rights whatsoever. And it's like, we're just so desensitized. And so it's something that has always been really challenging for the media to report on and acknowledge is media influence. That's why your show is so refreshing, Gina. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, that's like the one topic that the media won't touch. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Thank you to my guest, Renee Hobbs, Professor of Communication Studies at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island and Director of the Media Education Lab. This was part one of our conversation. You can hear part two next week. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.